Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report. I'm Dick Wallenhaus from Watanwan County, Minnesota. Tonight we have as our special guest Mr. Erhard Finkston, Vice President of the National Farmers Organization. Mr. Finkston farms about 500 acres near Sergeant Bluff, Iowa. Mr. Finkston, recently I've heard you mention that we have a double standards in agriculture today as opposed to industry. Would you mind commenting on this a little bit? No, not at all. In fact, every time I hear them, it bugs me plenty. The two standards that you're talking about, they tell us that business and industry have to make a profit so that they can expand and employ more people. And I think that's 100% correct. But what gets me is that in agriculture, we're told that we have to do the very opposite. We're told that we have to eliminate people from agriculture and then expand so that then we can make money. And I'd like to repeat that, Dick, because I think this is very important that the people realize the double standard. Business and industry has to make a profit so that they can expand and employ more people. But agriculture has to eliminate people so that then they can expand and after having done those two, supposedly make money. I think this is two complete opposites. It re really finally gets down to what we're always being told is that somehow or other we have to make a profit without getting a price. This is indeed unique, Mr. Finkston. Uh, I think that our program is very unique in one way. It's a particular uh, comes to my mind, and that is we are probably the only farm organization that has a method of fully utilizing world food production or United States food production and feeding the world of hungry people. Would you like to make a few comments on this situation? Yes, we do have the capacity at any rate to feed our own people and probably produce beyond those needs. And actually, the way we're doing it now, we're depriving other nations of the world food by retiring our own resources here and have become dependent on other nations to supply what we're not producing here. Now, I think probably the most glaring of these, and this would re uh, reflect itself on the entire farm commodity situation, is in meat. Now, there has not been one single year, not one, since 1952 that the American farmer has produced enough meat to feed this nation. In 52, we started importing, and each year increased the amount that we imported. And then in 1963, we got up to where we were importing 11% of all of the meat consumed in the United States. And that's the year when the farmers of this nation, or the meat producers, livestock producers, lost two and a half billion dollars. Now this last year, we are up to somewhere between 15 and 20% of all meat consumed was imported or came from other nations. Now what we've done, we've destroyed our own producers by eliminating farmers who were producing livestock and have depended on the imports to make up the difference. Now to show you how the utilization of our production would help, even in this country, we retired at the very height of our government programs, 11% of the productive acres. Now had we produced, going back to 1963 for example, that 11% more meat that was needed in this nation, it would have required 11% more grain and 11% more roughage, 11% more of each. Now we could not possibly have done that. Even if we had brought every single idle acre back into production, we could not have produced the meat that this nation need in the methods or manner that we're farming today. We would have very decidedly have had to intensify our method of producing in order to supply that. Yet. In our failure to supply it, we deprived the rest of the world of this production that we're getting in here. Argentina, for example, has a two, day, two days a week by law now that the people can't eat meat, trying to stretch the supply, and yet at the same time, we are importing from that nation. Now, this isn't coming in here priced competitively either. It comes in much higher price than what our farmers are getting here. In 1963, I prepared the, the uh, data for the oh, testifying to the Tariff Commission on the imports, so those are the figures, of course, that I'm best acquainted with. Well, in that particular year, 
the lowest priced meat that was coming into this nation was cow meat on the west coast. And it was there, it was 41 cents a pound. And on the east coast, a straight 42 and 43 cents a pound. And this is the same kind of meat that the farmers were selling in the Midwest here, right on the hoof, cow meat, at 10 cents a pound live. Or even if you want to figure it the dressed weight and took away, let's say 50% of that weight to dress out, it would have been still sold here by the American farmers for 20 cents a pound. Now this is a commodity in which we have never produced enough for the, for the last 15 years to feed our people, and we're not getting a price there either. It seems uh, quite strange that uh, we here in the United States do have productive capacity that we could use. In other words, we, we probably could plant uh, pumpkins and all kinds of different vegetables and that sort of thing, and, and we have uh, literally millions of people throughout the world starving, yet we have not yet developed a system whereby we can produce fully and still keep from destroying our own domestic prices. Now, we do have a, a way of, of getting out of this mess once we have the farmers organized to the point where where they can uh, sell under a master contact structure and do industry-wide bargaining. Isn't this true? Yes. Uh, once you're operating under our contract, which for the listener's benefit, I think we should describe, our program is to get a full fair price for all the production that's needed here in the United States. A price based on our cost of production to sell our production on contract at least a year ahead and then produce for that contract. Now, at the same time, our program includes that we do the whole job of marketing. As I pointed out, full fair price for all that's produced here, and then channel the rest, if there is any extra, into secondary markets. In other words, use our resources the way God intended them to be used, to feed hungry people rather than to pile it up here. Actually, at times, even pay more than it's worth, make the producers here miserable with it, and uh, the people in the rest of the world that are hungry even more miserable, even if we quit or produced enough so that we produced enough for our own people and quit taking it away from the rest of the world should decidedly help alleviate hunger to some extent in the rest of the world. Well, this is refreshing for me and I'm sure for the rest of the television audience to know that we do have the methods and the way to tie down any kind of uh, surplus situation that would develop in the future. Yes, we have that right in our programs. First of all, the, the surplus disposal program is in there, whereby we can eliminate our surplus, surpluses if we produce more. But it is our, uh, our responsibility also as farmers, I think, to produce what this nation needs. And for that reason, we have in our master contracts, and these are contracts that are already signed by processors in all commodities, contracts that go into effect just as soon as a far enough farmers wake up, join our organization to fill these contracts. And we have the price incentive there, which lets us, the organization or the producers, put a high incentive price on whatever weight is needed. Now, first of all, let me explain the surplus disposal and see the effect of it. We've had a lot of, heard a lot of noise about surplus and overproduction in corn. Well, throughout the period that we've had the feed grain program, there's been no overproduction in corn. In fact, uh, through the life of the feed grain program, we have at n n in no year produced enough even to feed our own nation. We've had to dip into the reserves. But for each 11 years straight ahead of the feed grain program, we produced more than was needed. And it was an average overproduction for those 11 years of 3%, uh, 30, yes, 3%, a little bit less than 3%. But in that period of time, we lost way over 33% of our price. Now, had we been operating under the NFO contracts, eliminating this surplus year by year, or at least see to it that it couldn't be used to depress our prices, even if we had given away, given away now, I'm saying, Dick, 3% of our production and had maintained the other 30% of our price, we would be, have been receiving throughout this period a much higher price than we're receiving even now in a tight supply period by eliminating that. Now, this, the uh, price incentive, I think, is also very important in this uh, uh, regulating the supply. And this in meat, for example, uh, surplus don't develop overnight. They, you see them coming a long time ahead. 
And I'd like to use, for example, the period 1955-56. In the 54 period, we were getting pretty much around 27.50 for our hogs. But in 1955-56, in that winter, our hog price dropped down to ten and a half dollars a hundred. In other words, we lost way over half of our price. And we were told that the reason for it was that we had produced too much. Six percent, in fact, was the exact figure given. Now, we could see that coming. This didn't happen overnight. Now, had we been operating under the NFO program at that time and had used the price incentive, we could have placed the price incentive, let's say, on 200-pound uh, hogs high enough that a 200-pound hog would have brought more than a 235-pound hog. And 235 pounds was the average weight that they were marketed at at that year. In other words, it would have brought an, uh, an, a reduction of 35 pounds per hog. Now, let's do a little figuring and see what the percentage of reduction would mean in that area. On the basis of 200-pound hogs, each two pounds would be 1% of the total supply. So to arrive at the percentage difference, divide the 35 by, uh, by 2, and it would give you 17.5% difference in supply. Now take the 6% surplus that they said that we had in that period, Take that off of that 17.5% and what you would you have had? You'd have had an, a shortage, a shortage of 11.5% with exactly the same number of hogs. Now, this same thing could be used also in dairy production. I did hear a man say one time, this goes back a number of years ago, in the main milk producing area when the farmers were getting about $3 a hundred for their milk. If you guys get the price that you're talking about, six dollars and five cents tomorrow everybody going to start milking well of course the first question rises is what are they going to milk you gotta have a cow. yes didn't take the farmers long to explain that to him but you don't milk the fence posts it's got to come from cows now it takes three years to de develop a cow from the inception of the calf till you have it in production or very nearly three years so you would see any surplus arising there too now, we could use the same incentive plan here that I talked about, and this is already in the contract signed by processors, where we could put an incentive price on dairy heifer calves, for instance, say high enough that it'd take them into market, turn them into hamburger. Well, hamburgers don't give any milk, either now or three years from now. So all of these are things that you can do as an organized group, but there's absolutely nothing that you can do as an individual. Well, really, we could say, uh, Mr. Fengston, that that uh, once the master contract is activated, uh, these contracts actually solve the problem that exists within that industry, don't they? As far as promoting the product uh, the, when it needs promoting or as far as yes. disposing of a surplus. Yes. In other words, the contract creates the price. That's and then right. you use the price, once it's been created, to solve the rest of the problems that may exist. Yes. Right? Uh, even to the extent of promoting the product, see, as is provided in all of the contracts, dairy, grain, and meat, that one half of one percent has to be used to promote that particular product that that contract represents. In other words, you can give them the kind of uh, advertising that really sells the product and not just sells a brand. And I think very often we're getting hurt with brand advertising where, well, let's say in tobacco, for instance, you'll see ads that uh, make you think that if you smoke any other kind of cigarette but that one, you're uh, really going to get it. Well, it doesn't sell tobacco. It makes, I think it actually questions people or makes a, raise a question in people's mind about the tobacco itself. And I'm not upholding tobacco, but you have it in dairy. In my home area, there's a processor there that has been advertising how they vacuum their milk and so forth. And he leaves the impression, though he never says it, that there's no other brand that's even fit to drink, that you drink in filth if you go that way. And in my way of uh, saying that doesn't... Uh, doesn't promote the well, use uh, of milk. Yeah. His brand only, he's selling the rest of the milk down in, the river. Uh, in relation to that, sometimes you see uh, commercials, uh, read commercials, where, oh, yes. uh, where, where they say that there's animal fat in this uh, particular type of uh, shortening, just as if this and was a bad uh, thing. Yes, if that were a bad thing yeah. altogether, yes. Uh -huh. Now, this is it's not what they say, but it's the it's implied how they say uh, destruction of the product. Well, in your opinion, uh, really what good does it do for a group of farmers in a small area or a group of farmers just in one particular commodity to have a, a system whereby they, they promote that 
one commodity. Is there any long-range uh, beneficial effect from doing that type of thing? No, uh, no. I think to get nowhere, uh, you're you're really covering two uh, areas there. First of all, the local, and then the single commodity. Uh, this problem is not a single commodity problem in agriculture. It's all commodities are involved, and in addition to that. Uh, it is, cannot be solved in a local area because it's on a national basis. So it's going to take an organization that deals in all commodity and first of all is able to deal nationwide. The reason we're in the price hole that we're in is because our marketing, present marketing system is completely outdated. We're selling now to national corporations. Our buyers are national in scope. They're able to bypass any area, any individual, or any market, and actually pit one against the other and make them cut each other's throat. So supply and demand cannot work to set a fair price in that way because the bargaining power is so much different. For, to give a few examples to show how big this is, the chain stores are now handling 85% of all the meat consumed in the United States, and about five chains are handling about half of all the meat that's retailed. That's what I should have said instead of consumed, the meat that's retailed. And uh, here you have a position, see, where five buyers can establish the price on all of it. Now, in milk, according to Dr. Jacobson of the University of Ohio, who's a marketing specialist, 70% of all dairy production goes through basically four big users. So these are national in scope. They can let you set, they can let me set, they can let areas set, they can make us cut each other's throat or make areas. So it has to be an organization that is national in scope so that they can meet national buying power with national selling power. Then supply and demand would have a chance to operate when both sides are equal, but certainly you and I as an individual are no match for a national buyer. Now getting on to the local area or the co single commodity area, I think it takes an organization also that deals in all commodities so that you're not using one group against the other to cut each other's throat. And let's uh, use an example for that. When we had the 90 support formula in our farm programs, this was pretty much succeeding in giving us 100% of fair price for our production. In fact, we, uh, we averaged over 100% of uh, parity throughout the period that we had the 90% formula in there. Well, as cattle prices dipped, uh, the cattle feeders and then the milk price in the northeastern part of the nation dipped at the same time. They got together with several other groups and more or less decided that their problem wasn't their own price, that their problem was that they were paying too much for, f for a feed. So they reasoned if they could bring the feed price down, you see, that this would solve their problem. And so through lobbying, through force that uh, followed, that they collected, they managed to destroy the 90% formula in the farm program and gave us the sliding scale. I think few of us had uh, realized how fast we were going to slide under that thing and how hard we were going to hit when we slid to the bottom. But this is what substituted then till we got the feed producers into trouble. Well, a year ago this winter, with the fat cattle problem still being there, the price is going still lower, a feeders group in Iowa called their members together and asked them to put their hand on their heart and raise their other hand and take an oath that they were never ever going to pay any more than 14 cents for calves again. So here you see the group rather than solving their own problem was again now moving. They had the feed grain boys down on their prayer bones so now we're going to work on the people that produce the calves and uh, take it out on them. So I think it takes an organization that deals in all commodities and brings them all up in relative balance for the reason I just related and then also to keep from shifting out of one commodity into the other. If you brought the price of one commodity up, did nothing with the rest, then I think there'd be a gradual shift to that commodity. Everybody trying to make it there, and they'd probably destroy it too. Under the uh, helter skelter marketing system that uh, we're used to, I'm always kind of happy and uh, surprised that they pay us anything at all. But I, I think that what they like to do is pay us just enough so that they get another chance to do it to us again next year, isn't it, about the way well, you uh, th it Yes, this is pretty common, and I think it's obvious and evident, uh, especially in the meat marketing. When, you, when your price uh, goes down, 
And it looks like it's discouraging to the producers when, well, not only looks, it is when they're losing their shirt, then right off, quickly they start giving you the intentions of the farmers for next year. This was so obvious to me in 1955 and 56 when our hogs went down to 10 and a half. In October and September of that year, they were telling us what we were going to be doing in March and April that next year. In other words, my intentions were already being put out for next year, and I hadn't even given them a thought yet. Didn't even know whether I was going to be in business when it came. But my intentions were being broadcast that the production would be down, see, so that I'd be encouraged to produce on your market. They're doing it continuously. Hogs, it's obvious on this. When they get into a shorter supply, then they're putting a uh, higher price on 240, 260 pound hogs. Encourage the, the, the producer to feed them out to heavier weights. And by the time he gets them there, well then obviously enough anymore, they don't want 240, 260 pounds. Then they want light hogs, see, and they drop it down, they take us either way. And in reality, Dick, they have been controlling us on the production oh, right, just yeah. that way. Throughout the, the years, and this is really where we got the idea from to include it in our See, uh, contracts to regulate the, the supply. The industry uh, controls all the incentives, really, don't they? Sure. Now, uh, really, uh, it wouldn't really do us very much good if we'd produce 20% less of, let's say, uh, beef next year. So long as the retail part of our industry sets the price, uh, price on that beef, they'll just raise the retail price enough to ration it enough more that 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 80 percent of the supply will will last. There'll always be meat there to buy, right, right. but there'll just be less people who can afford to buy it. But you and I aren't going to get much. No, anymore. it'll work on the retail end, but they'll still dictate the price to to you and me as cheap as they can possibly get it. And why not? Because don't you and I go up to them and ask them what they want to give us? Why are we surprised when they tell us? I think you're real nice about. It. I, yeah, I yeah. agree with you. I'm surprised you're giving it as much as I think uh, we've been lucky. They uh, <laughs> give us a little something once maybe in a while. We, maybe we ought to write them all a letter of thanks for not ripping us any harder than well, they have been. We should send them a card on New Year's <laughs> yeah. at least. Uh, uh, there's uh, another thing that we've been reading in the news, uh, at least the farm news of late, and that is uh, some organized resistance to buying new machinery and equipment on the part of farmers. And what, what's your comment on this situation? Well, I think it has... Uh, some uh, advantage from this standpoint, if nothing else, at least they are getting the farmers to realize that they have a problem and perhaps in a remote manner getting them to do something about it. But as for the refusing to buy, that that'll solve their problem, I don't think so, for two reasons. Number one, they're hitting the wrong group. When we don't buy machinery, uh, it isn't our machinery dealer or our implement dealers that have been driving our prices down. So that group can't do anything about the situation, and we're not really striking at the group that is holding our price down. So this is number one. But number two, I think it can very well aggravate the situation in the long run. I happen to be testifying to the Government Cost Price Squeeze Committee when the president of one of our major implement companies was testifying too, and I thought he did probably one of the best jobs in testifying on the cost situation that I had ever heard or that anybody gave at that particular time. He was very well informed. He gave the figures of how much the farmers' costs had increased in the various fields, and of course at that time they had been taking a drop in price steadily and continuously for over 10 or 12 years. And he did point out that the cost of equipment was almost twice as high as when this downward trend started. And, of course, the point that he was making was that the farmers were going to have to get themselves a price just exactly the way that other industry does, a price based on their cost of production. And the man was literally crucified by the committee on the statements that he made because since he had recognized the fact that the farmers were being hurt by costs, then they asked him why did he as an implement producer, not lower the price of machinery. And the first thing he pointed out to them is that perhaps they were forgetting who he was, that he was not the president of a farm organization, but the president of an implement company. So he said it is his responsibility to turn a profit for his stockholders. This is the only thing that he's in position he was for, and that's correct. So he said when the number of units drop, units of production, my costs remain the same, the investment and so forth, and then if I'm going to turn 
a profit to the stockholders. The only way I can do it is raise the price per unit, increase this. And this is exactly what has been happening. So really, I think it works in reverse here, and I'd like to go just a little bit further with it. The entire country is getting hurt by the farmer's problem because every time the farmer gets shortchanged one dollar, it shortchanges the entire economy seven dollars. Now, I was speaking one time in, a, in 1964, this was, in Atlantic, Iowa, where the editor of the newspaper handed me a clipping of uh, oh, one of these 10 years ago today, 20 years ago today, and 50 years ago today. And the item in the 10 years ago today was uh, that some farmer in the Atlantic, Iowa, and he mentioned his name, had received or had topped the Omaha market with $27.50 in 1954, and this was a general price throughout that time. Of course, keep in mind that also during that period of time, all other prices were up there pretty fair shape. We were getting, I suppose, about $1.60 for corn, two and a quarter for wheat, uh, two eighty-five for soybeans and so forth. So we looked it up to see just what impact that had on how much farmers bought. And of course, the first thing that a farmer thinks about when he's talking about the things he buys is usually a tractor. So we looked this up in the farm statistics and we compared 1954 with 1963, which was the last complete year we had in the figures. And in 1954, when the farmers were getting a fair price for their production, the tractor manufacturers of this nation sold uh, 353,000 farm tractors. And yet in 63, at the lower prices, they had sold 172,000. So this was 181,000 less tractors that those they produced because the farmers weren't getting paid. And this, the dealers over the country didn't sell them. The working men nationwide didn't make these. See, so it hurts the whole industry. So I believe the approach of stopping to buying isn't going to solve the situation. No, it, uh, it's... You've got to hit the people who are driving your prices down. Those are the guys that you've got to get. Just like General Motors does. They set their price, they supply their dealers. If the dealer refuses to pay the price, he's no longer a dealer. He don't get any cars. And this is what we've got to do. Well, I'm very certain that uh, according to the progress that we've been making recently and uh, the overall feeling in agriculture, farmers are willing to accept the NFO plan for collective bargaining. Uh, we just have maybe about a minute left. Would you like to make a closing uh, remark or two, Mr. Finkston? Well, I think this is the only thing that's going to reverse the trend if the farmers themselves do it. Because it isn't going to be the people who have to pay the price that are going to see that the price goes up. If, it's, if the job's going to be done, it's going to be done through farmers, and they're going to do it in the same method that every industry has in this nation has used for the 200 years that this nation was in, in existence. It's the only thing that has ever worked for any other group. It is the only thing that has not been tried by farmers. Thank you very much, Mr. Finkton, for being on our program this evening. I trust that this program has been thought-provoking and a stimulus for action on the part of you, the viewer. Tune in next week for U.S. Farm Report. Thank you.